It ain't nothing mystical. The plays get made by the men in this group. Make those plays. Do your thing, Tutu. Hey, man, let's go. It's going to be a 15-round fight, all right? We got to fight today. We got to make plays. We got to pick each other up. Playmakers on three. One, two, three. Playmakers. Let's get it. With the Steelers and Ravens, every game is a fight. It is the most intense rivalry in professional football. And for good reason. A veteran player once said, the Steelers-Ravens game could be played at midnight in a parking lot. <laughs> 56 meetings of teams that love to hate each other. And the 57th matchup would be no different. Lumber Mike Tomlin show. Hi everybody and welcome to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin show. I'm Missy Matthews. The 32nd meeting between Mike Tomlin and John Harbaugh ended up just like several other matchups between the Steelers and Ravens. It was a physical one score game and the team that won the turnover battle came away with the victory. Unfortunately for Pittsburgh, they ended up on the wrong side of this one. And for more on their first meeting with Baltimore, let's welcome in Bob Pompiani, who's with Coach Tomlin. Guys. Missy, thank you very much. The Steelers coming off a very tough loss to the Ravens at home, a two-point game, 16-14. to 14. Mike, let's just talk about the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway from that game, because you were in position to win it uh, at the end. Really, man, it was classic uh, AFC North ball, and specifically Steelers-Ravens. Um, the end just didn't unfold um, the way we would like it or what we've been accustomed to, particularly of late. Um, whenever these two teams come together, it's generally a, a one-score game, and, and generally the team that, that takes care of the ball or the team that produces specifically the red zone turnover because it's point-related. You're taking points off the board. Um, when you get turnovers in the red area, you're either denying Boz three points or you're denying Tuck three points. And, and that's how this game's been. Um, January 9th up there uh, at the end of last season, um, we had an interception in the red zone, Cam Sutton, kind of at the beginning of the fourth quarter. And that was that significant point swing where they essentially had a minimum of three points on the board that was taken off that ended up being the difference in the game. And you could say the same thing about this game. You turn the ball over in the red zone, you're taking points off the board against two teams that really know each other. Uh, that play close games, oftentimes that's the difference. You talk about an unfortunate situation that happened with Kenny Pickett, knocked out of the game. Mitch Trubisky came in, and he seemed to move the ball quite a bit until those turnovers. How do you uh, assess his performance given all of that? Very much as you mentioned. I thought uh, he came in with the right spirit. Um, he didn't reduce our intentions by any stretch, but that's reasonable when you got a veteran backup, a guy able to come in, you're able to do the things you desire to do um, on a limited number of reps of prep. That cumulative resume allows them to do that. And he displayed that. I thought we moved the ball fluidly, uh, but we had those two or three plays where we turned the ball over, and those two or three plays are significant. They're significant in any NFL game, but particularly as these two teams come together, or at least the history of these two teams coming together would indicate. After the game, he said he wanted to be aggressive, but he may have crossed the line into reckless. Is that pretty much what happened in those? Because you had the ball deep in their territory. I think it's easy to have that perspective, you know, hindsight being 2020. Uh, but we play to win, and, and we don't play not to lose. And, and I think he shares that spirit. Um, we just got to be better at taking care of the football. As far as the physicality of the game, you know the Ravens are going to run the ball. That's their identity. Was it more uh, a schematic breakdown on your defense in terms of stopping the run, or was it just – Man on man, and they won that battle. I think it's a little bit of both. I think whenever you're, you're unsuccessful, uh, it's always both. We could have put them in some better schematic positions. I think at times um, they did some good things schematically to get guys at, at, at proper angles in an effort to maybe win some blocks. And, and then ultimately, um, the meat on meat, bone on bone component of it. As the game wore on, I thought the pile fell in the direction in which they would desire. And, and oftentimes it may not be significant, but the totality of it is. The, the pile falls one way, it's second and eight. It falls another way, it's second and six. Um, you do it twice, you're looking at third and two versus third and four. And, and those downs are played very differently. 
Um, and, and, and ultimately, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the attrition game. I don't want to understate it, but those couple of yards in terms of how Paul, how a pile falls is significant um, in the big scheme of things as, you, as, you, as the snaps mount. Final score was what we pretty much expect. As you said, this is always a one-possession game. Uh, looking back at special teams, um, the fact that, you know, you had a 17-yard punt and it's flipped the field position. We sat there last yep. week and talked about those kind of moments in those games. But, but that's why we talk about it, because we, we know how significant net punting in when, he, when these two teams come together. Not only the 17-yard punt, but, but we, we had a chance to punt and put them on a long field and we had a touchback. They punted, we had a penalty, they gave them a 56-yard net when you tacked on the penalty to their punt. And so the totality, those blades of grass and net punting, collective net punting, results, you know, plays out in the form of field positioning. And in a game where it's usually down to one score, three points here, three points there, um, that field positioning is often the difference. You coaches have to make thousands of decisions a game. I, I thought the one at the end of the game was an interesting one. Onside kick versus kick it deep. You still had plenty of time. I know you trust your defense. And, and I guess the uh, metrics of an onside kick being successful aren't very good. What went into that decision, and how many things were you thinking it, about? It that? really was no decision. We, we, had, we had multiple timeouts. We were on the right side of two minutes. And as you mentioned, just analytically, um, the onside kick, the preset onside kick, is not a high probability play. Um, you're hoping when you do that. And we had too many tangible variables that told us to kick the ball deep to even really seriously consider that. All right, Steelers now in need of a win as they head to Carolina, a team that finds themselves knocking at the door to potentially win that division. We'll talk about the Panthers coming up shortly, Missy. Let's go back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And this will mark the Steelers' fourth and final matchup against the NFC South. Well, these two teams have met in the preseason 22 times, but tomorrow will mark just the eighth meeting between Pittsburgh and Carolina in the regular season. Later in our show, Merrill Hodge draws us up a playbook on how the Steelers recently improved their running game. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show. Well, just when the Steelers snapped their winning streak, their opponent tomorrow has started one of their own. The Panthers have won two straight games in three out of four as they've started to gain momentum under their interim head coach. And for more on what to expect tomorrow, let's send it back over to Bob and Coach. Guys. Hey, Missy, it's a matchup against Carolina, and the Panthers are on fire, and, and Coach uh, Steve Wilkes has done a pretty good job. Interim guy, a guy I'm sure you're familiar with with this time as defensive coordinator. I guess it was in Cleveland back there. What has he done to energize this team down in Carolina? I've known Steve for a long time. As you mentioned, he's been a coordinator in multiple settings. He also was a head coach in, in Arizona, and so it's not anything that's new or foreign to him. Um, he's done a nice job of dividing the labor up and, and minimizing what they're asking individuals to do. And, and thus, I think he's raising the collective floor of the group and, 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 and doing a really good job of playing good fundamental football in all three phases. One thing about you, you've been around long enough, and I say that with all due respect, but now, it's okay. now, it's okay. you're, now you're coaching sons of guys you knew, and you have J.C. Horn this week. You had Michael Pittman. You have others. Yeah. Now, what does that feel like? It seems like every game you're saying, hey, tell your old man I said hi. It, it, it's, it's sobering, <laughs> to, to, to say the least, you know. Particularly when you look at a guy like J.C., you know, when I came into the league as a secondary coach, his dad was doing it big in, in New Orleans at the time, and, and we were an NFC South team, so I saw his old man twice a year and what he was capable of. Um, it's cool, really, to, to, to have that perspective, to, to see what a genetic game this game is, to be able to kind of relay stories to the young people about their parents, because, you know, let's be honest, they see their parents as parents. And sometimes it's cool to be able to tell them a story about them as a professional, to, to allow them to appreciate them from a different perspective as opposed to dad. And he's certainly got good bloodlines. JC's one of the better corners. This defense, they invested in it. How difficult is this defense to go against? They got quality players at every level. Uh, up front, Burns is, 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 is tough to handle. The big man, 95 out of Auburn, um, is a power player who happens to be athletic inside. They got a stabilizing force in Shaq on the second level. Shaq was raised by Luke Keekley and Thomas Davis, and you see that. 
Um, his zone defense, his eyes, his ability to close horizontal windows as an underneath defender. Um, you just you just really appreciate it. And, and you think about how expertise is handed down in our game from generation to generation. You know, um, Luke Keekley and Thomas Davis didn't play for this regime, but I see their presence in Shaq's play because he's a young guy that had an opportunity to grow underneath them. And, and Chen is a quality player at the safety position. Um, Horn, as you mentioned, has all the physical tools. He's good on the line of scrimmage. He's good off the line of scrimmage. He's a strong tackler. His bump technique is, is really solid. His off footwork is very good. He just looks like a guy that's mature beyond his years, like a guy that's grown up around the game whose parent has been involved in it. And last week they ran the ball for 223 yards against Seattle. Very impressive performance there with Deontay Foreman, Chuba Hubbard. I would imagine they're going to do the same. Um, your, your team has just given up a lot of yards in that department. How critical would that matchup be? I really think the game and how the game unfolds oftentimes dictates the amount of that and the quality of that. They've leaned on it the last two weeks because they've been in control of games and they've had leads. Um, Baltimore was in front of them and it kind of changed the perspective of that a little bit three weeks ago. And so it's important that we, we main control, maintain control of the game, that we score points early, that we minimize their ability to get in that mode, if you will. And when, it, when they're in that mode, we got to meet the fire with the fire. We got to shed blocks. We got to make tackles and, and we got to play that style of ball ourselves on the other side and control it. Yeah, this game coming up at 1 o'clock on Sunday. You'll see it on KDKA. When we come back, we'll have the keys to this matchup, the Steelers and the Panthers. Missy, let's go back to you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And this will mark just the fourth regular season meeting between these two teams in Carolina and the first since 2014. The Steelers are 2-1 and one as the away team in this series. Coming up next here on the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show, Merrill Hodge dials up some proof on why he thinks the Steelers have started to improve on the ground. Now it's time for the Inch Chat Trivia question. Who holds the Steelers' single game record for rushing yards versus Carolina? Le'Veon Bell or Jerome Bettis? We'll tell you next. Welcome back to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show. Your Yin's Chat trivia answer is Le'Veon Bell. In week three of the 2014 season, Bell rushed for 147 yards in a 37-19 win over the Panthers. Yin's Chat is the Steelers' official predictive and trivia game. Answer questions, make picks, and win prizes. Play Yin's Chat exclusively on the Steelers' official mobile app. Coming out of the Steelers' bye week, we saw several improvements to the team's offense. And prior to the Ravens game, Pittsburgh had rushed for over 100 yards in five straight games. So why were they so successful? Merrill Hodge explains it in this week's playbook. Hi, everyone. Welcome into the Factor Back Studios for the Accusure Playbook. This week, we're gonna talk about playoffs. playoffs. That's right, playoffs. We even got the fans out there talking about playoffs. Listen, here's about playoffs. Every team that's gonna go to the playoffs is doing one thing really well. They're winning in the trenches, they're controlling the line of scrimmage, especially on offense, because that's where we're gonna focus today. Well, that is where the offense or the Steelers have gotten so much better. Their offensive line has finally come together and five guys are working as one. Even the perimeter guys doing a much better job. So let's take a look at the line of scrimmage early in the year, how they were block, run blocking versus how they're blocking now. So we've talked about this a lot. The most important line in football, the line of scrimmage. You have to win the line of scrimmage. Now early in the season, they were not winning the line of scrimmage. Here's a great example. Snap of the ball, runner has the ball. Patriots have won the line of scrimmage. They're playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. When this happens, very hard to run the football. Najee gets tackled for a minimal gain, if, if not maybe a loss of one. Another issue with this, we weren't, just weren't blocking very well. People were missing blocks right here. Boy, when you, when you come this side and you leave people open inside, you got free defenders here. It's tough on your runner to get any yards. This was what was happening now early in the year. They just weren't controlling the line of scrimmage. Even when they tried to get to the perimeter, trying different types of runs, they weren't winning it. Again, let's use the line of scrimmage. 
most important line. We snap the ball. Ball carrier has the ball. Especially point of attack, you're losing the line of scrimmage. They're playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Really tough on your runner, because penetration is the number one killer in the running game. And here's another great example of it from the end zone. First of all, here's Najee's point of view. That's, try, that's where the targeting point, he's trying to get outside and then any running lane that materializes, he's gonna get up in the lane. But you gotta win at the line of scrimmage. Well, you snap the ball, once he has the ball in his hands, well look what's happened. Got a Patriot already went into the inside right here. Well that makes it really hard on your runner to keep getting outside. He's forced to go in here. That's why penetration, number one killer, it defines where your runner is gonna go. When you do that, get off the block, you make tackles. Okay, well that's early in the year. Now let's go fast forward, but the last few weeks, this is how they've been playing. Line of scrimmage, we snap the ball. Once the runner has the ball in his hands, really good job, here's the line of scrimmage. Okay, we got guys, especially at the point of attack. Okay, you got guys winning over here. You got a running room. This gives your runner an opportunity. Does a great job of getting to the outside. Little turf monster there, but he didn't go down, but a big chunk of yards. Now from the end zone, this is a really good example. Once we get the handoff, beautiful job of counting for people. Got people accounted here, you got a wall here. So you have running lanes for your back. Now we're gonna fast forward or snap it. I'm gonna show you something else that's really important here. Right there, your perimeter player. Pickens right here makes a great block. That really springs it for a big run. Your perimeter players have to be a big part of it and they have been that. So offensive line is controlling the line of scrimmage and when Najee gets in the open field, I mean, he's a wicked runner. Again, line of scrimmage, this is what you have to win. This might be the very best one. This is kind of how they've been playing a majority of the time. Once the ball carrier has the ball, look at that. Now that is a dominant the line of scrimmage. You're playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. You get this cat, some running lanes, and really all these backs have done a great job of complementing. But I want to show you something that Najee does from the end zone angle here that really helps your offensive line. We call it hugging the double team. So what they're doing is they're going to double here up to this linebacker. It's important that the runner hug this double team to hold this linebacker right here to help those two guys. Not to leave and wander back and forth, help these guys. So watch this. He does a beautiful job of this. As he comes downhill, he stays here. When you stay here, you keep this linebacker here and that just makes it so much easier for guys to be accounted for. Now Najee will eventually get out here, but he doesn't go there right away and that's important. Had he done that, this run wouldn't have been as big, even though they dominated up front. But they do that, he makes a big run, another 13, 14 yard run. Those are big time runs in the NFL. They keep playing like this, we can save playoffs. They win throughout and win the rest of these games, there's a chance these Steelers are going to the playoffs. And you can head to the Steelers official YouTube page to find more of Merrill's playbooks from earlier this season. Well, just a few weeks ago, the Steelers picked up their eighth consecutive win against Indy, and their second longest winning streak sits at six games, and it's against tomorrow's opponent. So for more on how they can extend it on Sunday, let's send it over to Bob and Coach for your keys to the game presented by your neighborhood Ford store. Guys. All right, Missy, thanks. Panthers, Steelers, uh, 1 o'clock on Sunday. Coach, you have four games left. You have a relatively young team here, especially on offense. What is your message as you enter the Final Four? I don't know that I've, I've packaged a collective message. Um, you know, I think for the reasons that you mentioned, we're young and developing and the challenges that each and every week presents, the uniqueness of each week's challenges. I've just really been trying to narrow their focus, and, and I talk more about the here and now. And so – um, our conversations are about this week and the challenges that Carolina presents, particularly because they're an unfamiliar group to us. We don't play them every year, and, and, and so it merits that. Um, the changes that they've been through recently, the coaching changes, the changes at quarterback, um, the division of labor and how they've changed personalities since their bye really kind of merits that we give um, the here and now our time and attention. And so it's been, it's been less of that. Uh, probably than normal circumstances. They're coming off a performance and a win in, in Seattle. Never an easy place to play. 223 yards rushing, but they got a lead. 
And when, when you have that lead, you can pound that ball a little bit more. So how important is the start in this game? It's important that, that we take care of the ball early on. Seattle turned that ball over uh, early in the game, and that was a catalyst of them to play from that position that you mentioned. Uh, we got to move the ball. We got to possess it. We got to we got to score. We do those things at a natural rate. We do those things the way that we've been doing it in recent weeks in terms of how we come out of the locker room. Uh, we'll be in position to minimize some of that attrition football that they play. But at the end of the day, there's no there's no secret formula for attrition football. You meet that force with force, and, and that's what we better do. The days of Luke Keekley and Thomas Davis are over, but they got some really good young people on that defense. They seem to have invested heavily in it. How good is it? You know, I think they're writing that story each and every week. I tell you, with each with each passing day, I see the growth and maturation in a, in a young guy like Brian Burns. Um, to see that just just take off. Um, and the same thing with J.C. Horn. He missed a significant amount of time in his rookie year. And boy, you're seeing him growing by leaps and bounds with each tape you turn on in year two. I think guys like that, young, talented people like that, are cornerstones that could be the catalyst of a good defense for years to come for those guys. Key on offense for you? Again, I think it's to move the ball fluidly, um, to don't get behind the chains. If we do that, uh, then we're in a, we put ourselves in a position to score points and keep those guys off balance. The things that we've been doing in recent weeks, um, uh, minus obviously uh, the turnover component that happened last week. Um, if we do those things and focus on us, divide our labor up, spread the ball around to our eligibles, be intentional and thoughtful about the run-pass mix, uh, we should be fine. All right, Coach, all the best to you in Carolina. Thank you. That's going to do it for our show tonight. Thank you for joining us. Remember to join us before the game, 11.30 in the morning for the pregame. We have two hours of postgame afterwards. It's a 1 o'clock kickoff on KDKA. And that's going to do it for our program. Our thanks to Coach Mike Tomlin, Missy Matthews, I'm Bob Pompiani. We'll see you next week for another edition of the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show.